Greetings and welcome to the General Mills Fiscal 2021 Q4 Earnings Call. During the presentation, all participants will be in the listen-only mode. Afterwards, we will conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press the one followed by the four on your telephone. If at any time during the conference you need to reach an operator, please press star zero. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded on Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. I would now like to turn the conference over to the VP of Investor Relations, Mr. Jeff Seaman. Please go ahead. Thank you, Frank, and good morning. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today for our Q&A session on fourth quarter results. I hope you had a time to review our press release, listen to our prepared remarks, and view our presentation materials, which were made available this morning on our Investor Relations website. It's important to note that in our Q&A session, we may make forward-looking statements that are based on management's current views and assumptions, including facts and assumptions related to the potential impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on our results in fiscal 22. Please refer to this morning's press release for factors that could impact forward-looking statements and for reconciliations of non-GAAP information, which may be discussed on today's call. I'm here this morning with Jeff Harmoning, our Chairman and CEO, Kobe Bruce, our CFO, and John Newdy, Group President of our North America Retail segment. Let's go ahead and get to the first question. Frank, can you get us started, please? Thank you. If you would like to register a question, please press the one four on your telephone. You will hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the one four by the three. One moment, please, for the first question. Our first question comes from Ken Goldman with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed. Hey, good morning. Thank you. Um, uh, two for me. Um, the first is, can you give us a sense of what to expect for the cadence of the uh, cost inflation this year? And then the second one is the street, I think, is looking for you know maybe about 40 basis points uh, in your gross margin in terms of the decline year on year in fiscal 22. I know you're not guiding into this, but given what you've said about inflation, HMM, and, and pricing, and, and really net pricing, is, is it kind of reasonable to expect something in this range, or is that far off from what you're looking for? Thank you. Hey, Ken. Uh, this is uh, Kofi. Thanks for the uh, question. So uh, as we look at the year, um, I think it's important for us to just give some perspective, and I'll, I'll address it maybe through the lens of, of uh, the flow of, of margin we would expect our, our, our back half to deliver um, higher margins uh, than the front half, in particular pressure on Q1, where we would see the, the combination, obviously, of inflation um, and pricing that starts later in the quarter, um, the benefits of pricing flowing through later in the quarter. So um, as for the, the flow of those, uh, that, 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 that guidance on, on margins would reflect um, roughly uh, you know, relatively balanced uh, flow on our expectations for the full year um, for, for inflation. Um, and then obviously with the, the pricing um, really kicking in as we, we step in, into uh, Q2. All right, thank you. And then the, the, this is the second question. Is that 40 basis points for the year that the street is looking for? Is that far out of line with what you're thinking, Kofi? Well, we're, we're not going to give guidance at, uh, at, at gross margin, um, but, but obviously our, our guidance on, on profit, on operating profit and, and sales um, would indicate uh, uh, something uh, in, the, in the range of uh, a modest decline in operating profit margin. Okay. Thanks so much. You bet. Our next question comes from Andrew Lazar with Barclays. Please proceed. Thanks for the question. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Andrew. Um, Jeff, I know you use the words um, dynamic and, and uncertain a bunch of times in your prepared remarks. And um, even though the consumer side of things may be getting maybe a little bit more visible, you know, obviously the cost and, and comparison side of the equation are, are still pretty challenging. So I guess my question is, how much flexibility um, do you think you've left yourselves in the FY22 guidance in light of the industry challenges, also knowing how the timing of, of pricing and, and other actions tends to, to work to offset costs? 
Yeah, Andrew, I think your observation is a good one. And we do, we use dynamic and we use uncertain. You know, I don't also say volatile, so we can throw that one in too, right? And, and it is, uh, from a demand perspective, it still is volatile. And even if mentally many consumers are getting beyond COVID, the, the demand environment is volatile, uh, not only re with respect to at home versus away from home consumption, but also, you know, what is the impact of pricing going to be and what does that mean for elasticity? So I would say the demand environment is still uh, volatile, and as is the cost environment. And, uh, and so whether that's, whether that's input costs on manufacturing or whether that's um, transportation or whether those are commodities, you know, it is a pretty volatile environment. You know, what I'm, what I'm proud of is, you know, over the past year, you know, we've been able to navigate that well and do what we said we're going to do. In fact, you know, each of the last three years we've done what we said we're going to do. And, and uh, now we still have to face this year. And, uh, but I, I feel good about our guidance. I don't think it is. I don't think it's it, it's so conservative, and I don't think we're out over our skis. You know, we, we're kind of, we're trying to tell you here's what we think we will do, and uh, is it is it easy in this kind of environment? No, but um, but I feel good about our capabilities and how we're executing right now, and we're very clear on our path forward. So all of those things give me confidence that we can do what we said we're going to do. But it's a you know it's a tricky environment. I think that it will be. Thanks for that. And then there was a survey done recently um, that we read about that one of the large CPG brokers, and it showed how, I guess, manufacturers were more optimistic about um, sort of sales trends in the back half of this calendar year compared to retailer expectations. And I, I didn't know if you've encountered sort of this divide in expectations in your discussions with your key customers, and, and if you have, maybe why you think this gap exists with respect to the differential again and expectations around maybe sales and or stickiness between you know manufacturers and and retailers thank you yeah andrew you know and this, this i want this to come off in the right way but you know what i said just a second ago that it's volatile i think this is exhibit a uh, when you have a group of one 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 group thinking one thing another another just shows that there is a level of uncertainty and volatility that would be the first point the second is that you know if you look at our guidance for the year you know, we said we'd be down modestly on um, on sales, minus one one percent to minus three percent. And I can tell you that, you know, we're we're lockstep with our retail uh, customers, and uh, we have good partnerships with them. And you know, we're, we're pretty well aligned with with what they think. And so, uh, but but I can understand why there are differences because it is a volatile environment. It probably varies by category. You know, as well as geography. So, uh, so we, we're we're very well aligned with our with our customers, not only on the demand environment, but but also the cost environment. They see the same cost pressures we do, and uh, you know we've we've instituted pricing in the vast majority of our categories and markets throughout the world. And while while no one wants to increase prices, um, you know we've had to do that because the cost environment is what it is, and and we have found them to be understanding because they're in the same kind of boat that we are. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Robert Mosco with Credit Suisse. Please proceed. Um, hey, thanks. Um, I, I was thinking about the terms that you're using, Jeff, um, to describe the environment as volatile, but uh, I want to get a little tighter on it because I, I would say that the cost environment is very volatile and, and maybe the pricing as well. But your opening comments would indicate that demand has been uh, fortuitously strong, and it has stayed strong. So are you saying demand is volatile, too, or are you just saying it's uncertain? Because I, I would describe it as uncertain because you just don't know how their people will react in the fall when maybe they go back to school and go back to offices. Yeah, I would say, uh, Rob, you know, I appreciate the distinction. I, I would say that, that – what we have seen in the recent past is not very volatile. In fact, it's been pretty steady. And, and it, 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 I'm, honestly, it's kind of playing out as we thought it would, which is our, our business was down in the last quarter versus where it was last year during the stock up. It was actually quite a bit higher than it was pre-pandemic, you know, as are our shares. And, you know, we, we've been talking for quite some time that although in some corners people thought demand would kind of fall off a cliff when, when people started going back to the office and got kind of returning to normal pre-pandemic, we said we think actually some of these behaviors will be will be sticky, and that's what we have seen. So it has been it hasn't been volatile in the recent past. Um, the, the question, you know, what's going to happen for the remainder of the year as as pricing kicks in, as we as kids go back to school, as we hit the fall? I think it'll be I think it'll be a volatile environment. We're calling it the best we can given our assumptions. 
But that, you're, you are correct. It hasn't, it hasn't been volatile in the recent past, but as we look ahead three months and six months, um, I think that'll be, the, that'll be what we're going to be dealing with. Okay. And I would note during that period, Rob, we, we still expect at-home food consumption to be above pre-pandemic levels, uh, even if it's below, uh, slightly below a year ago. Right. Okay. And, and this question might be more in the weeds, but the, the, the strategy and in, in grow, uh, I guess, division or organization that you're creating internally, is that just combining some corporate functions together, like corporate insights and M&A together? Or are you expanding the role and, and taking some of the responsibilities of the business units, like revenue growth management maybe, and, and pulling it into this, this division? Like, like how is this? How, how, how big of a change is this, uh, this, this division you, you've developed? Yeah, it's a, um, you know, I, I would say it's a decent sized change, but what, what we're not doing is taking operating responsibility out of the business. And in fact, what we're doing is pushing operating responsibility for the near term and more closely aligned to the businesses, which is really important. So we're, we are doing that. In terms of the strategy area itself, we are centralizing some of the capabilities because you, you, don't want to, you don't want to do modeling, for example, in many different places. You want to be able to do that in one central location, but then it's up to the businesses themselves to use that modeling and then to decide what's best for their businesses. So you want some centralized capabilities so you can develop scale and expertise, but then you want the use of those models to be in the businesses who are responsible for the P&L. So that's what we're, we're doing that. The other thing we're doing, I would say, is that similar to what we've done with um, strategic revenue management over time, where, you know, at one, point, at one point in time, many years ago, it was, you know, something we did periodically was think about pricing, and we turned it into an always-on kind of function. The same would be true of our strategy function. We're kind of beefing up our strategy function um, as well as M&A as we, as we look to the future and, and certainly what we need to do to hit our sustainable top-line growth targets is we need to keep competing effectively, but we also need to do more portfolio shaping. And so in that sense, we have a, an always-on strategy group that is maybe different than what we have done in the recent past. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Our next question comes from Laurent Grande with Guggenheim. Please proceed. Yes, uh, good morning, everyone. And, and, and maybe if, if I can come back in, uh, on one of those questions. So when you say at-home consumption will be more elevated than in a post-pandemic, in a, uh, post-pandemic I, mean, I think that's probably what uh, the assumption for everyone. Now, by how much, it's really a question. So could you maybe help us understand your thinking process, uh, maybe by category, how you see in a, those more elevated than in a, um, assumption post-pandemic and, uh, and what is uh, triggering this uh, in your view? You know, Laurent, I think, you know, you know, for this call, it's probably not helpful for us to go category by category, but I think if, if I can give you, you know, what's, under, what's underlying the assumption as to why we think this is going to happen. In our human food business, and I'm going to separate pet, but in our human food business, what I would say is that there are a couple of factors underlying our belief that we'll continue to see demand that's above pre-pandemic levels. The, the first is that we, more people are going to work from home more often than, uh, than go into the office every day. And uh, we're, we're fairly certain that that is here to stay. So there will be a new normal and, and where people work. You know, the second is that consumers, many millennials, have, uh, have really gained cooking skills and baking skills and, and newfound confidence in the kitchen. And they can find that they can save money by doing it. And so while they, we're not saying people won't want to still go out to eat, we believe that there's a younger generation that maybe not have, have done this before. Our penetration data would show this, especially in the U.S., that we have that we have a whole new group of consumers that have elevated demand. The, the third would be that you know our, our e-commerce business you know has grown rapidly over time. In fact, it's now 11% of our sales up from five, 18 months ago. And and while the continued growth may not be linear over the next period of time, many people have found shopping at grocery stores become much easier than it was before. And anytime you add convenience to someone's lives, it tends to stick. So for all of those reasons in our human food business. We believe even as people go out to restaurants more, even as kids start to go back to school, there will be some, there will be some of the demand that is, um, that is sticky for food at home. The, you know, the other thing I would say for pet is a little bit more straightforward, and that they're, fr frankly, they're, they're more pets than there than were before. 
And um, that is certainly true here in the U.S. It's true in other parts of the world as well, but particularly in the U.S. And 85% of those new pets are, are in homes that um, already contain one pet. And so these are people who are used to having pets. And so the, you know, the amount of pet food that's going to be consumed over the next few years we think is going to be elevated, in addition to the fact that the, the fastest growing part of pet continues to be the natural segment, which is where blue buffalo competes. And so um, we would anticipate um, that the, the category itself will be above what it has been the last couple of years and that, that natural will, will uh, remain ahead of the category in terms of growth. Thanks, and, and if I may, I got a second question. It's, it's, uh, it's about plant-based dairy. We have seen, I mean, recently an increased interest in plant-based dairy from consumers uh, and actually also from investors as well. So could you please update us where, what, what's the plan with your, your play brand in, uh, in the U.S. and Canada as well as, again, that internationally and, uh, and potentially maybe update us about your cat investment as well. Thanks. Uh, hey, Laurent, it's John Newdy. I uh, hope you're well. Um, so the yogurt category in the U.S. Is, is really starting to accelerate. So it was up 5% in April and May, up 2.5% in June. And really what's driving that is the Simply Better Health segment. So that was up 31%. So that's uh, products like uh, Ratio Keto, which is one of our products, Too Good and Triple Zero. And we put plant-based in there as well. So we're definitely seeing growth in that segment. Uh, in terms of, of yield play, we launched a we a plant-based uh, product uh, several years ago that continues to do quite well. We're actually looking at launching a yield play plant-based product in the coming year as well. So it's still relatively small in yogurt in the U.S., growing quickly. Uh, really, that simply better health segment with uh, you know the uh, dairy-based uh, products like uh, Ratio Keto and Too Good and Triple Zero is where the bulk of the growth is. So plant-based remains an area of focus for us. I would tell you it's not the biggest segment and probably not where the bulk of the growth will come in the coming year. Thanks. And internationally for, for Hagendas, any, any plan there? You know, when it comes to, to plant-based ice cream, I think it's a very, very, very small part of the category. What I will say is our Hagendas business has been growing very, very nicely and continues to do well all over the world. Um, particularly strong growth in China and in Europe this past year. And, you know, we've got some great innovation coming on haagen And so plant-based is really small, but we are, we are confident that we can continue to grow our haagen business really well in, in key geographies and looking for a summer where uh, more consumers are out and about. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I, I pass it on. Thanks. Thank you, Laurent. Thanks. Our next question comes from Jason English with Goldman Sachs. Please proceed. Hey, Jason. Pardon me, Mr. English. Uh, you're getting out. I don't know if you can uh, reestablish the connection. Uh, how about I switch headset? Is this better? That's much better. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Okay, sorry about that. Um, all right, so now that you've announced price increases in the vast majority of your categories and markets, can you give us some clarity on how much net price realization you expect to realize in your down one to three, four year organic sales outlook? Yeah, Jason, uh, this is Kobe. Uh, appreciate the question. Let me uh, let me give you a, a frame to, to think about this. So as we we get guidance on inflation of uh, about 7%. Um, we would expect our holistic margin management uh, to, to, to register about four percentage points of cost of goods sold. So that would, that would offset a, a good portion of the inflation. And obviously in this environment, we, we would need some, some additional price realization. While we're not quantifying it, we would expect the, the combination of levers through strategic revenue management, both list pricing, price pack optimization, um, you know, trade optimization, all of those things to, to uh, yield us enough to cover our inflation expectations. Okay. So take that remaining 3% of COGS and gross it up to revenue is, is probably a, a safe place to go right now. I think I think I heard you say. Um, switch, switching gears, but still remaining kind of on the topic of offsetting inflationary pressures, um, your, your recent restructuring announcement, uh, I, I thought you were going to have a lot more meat on the bone with it, uh, to, to give us today on this. 
but there's not a lot. Can you give us more clarity um, around the initiatives, including the expected cost savings and how much you expect to reinvest? Well, uh, I will give you a, a frame to think about this, and, and let, me, let me sort of touch on w what we're getting at. This is not simply a cost savings exercise, as Jeff kind of alluded to in some of his, his uh, earlier answer. We are sort of aligning resources to, to growth-facing purposes, um, so there is there is in here an expectation that we will prioritize uh, areas like digital and data and analytics. Um, SRM uh, strategy and M&A, as, as Jeff mentioned earlier, those things are all critical to, to sort of maintaining the growth engine. Our expectation after this exercise is that um, our admin costs as a percent of net sales will be roughly in line with our fiscal 21. So they will, they will keep pace with the, the sales decline. That's helpful. Thank you. I'll pass it on. Our next question comes from Brian Spillane with Bank of America. Please proceed. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, hey, Brian. Good morning. Hi. So, so my, I guess my question is just around is we're, we're working through our models and, and thinking about and, and trying to factor in inflation. Maybe, Kofi, could you give us a little bit of a, a some, some color on maybe which segments are going to, you know, feel more inflation than others? Um, and maybe just, just how we could think of how we should be thinking about the, the potential volatility of inflation just, just within segments. And then I guess tied to that question is just as we're, uh, you know, thinking about um, the, the, you know, the, the revenue management component of covering inflation, um, you know, is it, is it more pronounced in some segments than others? Just trying to get a sense of, of you know, how we should be looking at that across segments or is it really generally the same across all of them? Now, I appreciate the, the question, and I, while I, I don't want to get too specific at the segment level, what I will tell you is um, all, all of our segments are experiencing higher inflation. Um, we are uh, addressing in all of our segments with a mix of, of holistic margin management um, in line with our historical levels, levels and um, at SRM, um, I mean, using the, the entirety of the SRM toolkit um, in, in all five of the segments. And, and, and then maybe just just to follow up, as, as you know, I know there's been a lot of talk about you know pricing price increases as, as part of the the, the, the way to um, to combat inflation. We've heard that across you know our whole coverage universe. It, what do we expect on the back side of that, right? So it, you know, as, as some of this inflation moderates, hopefully, um, would, would the expect, expectation be that this pricing has stuck? Or, or, or would there be the potential that some of it would have to be dealt back as inflation moderates? Just trying to understand just how unusual this environment is, just how we should be thinking about the stickiness of those price increases if, if and when inflation rolls over. You know, I, you know, what we'll probably, you know, usually we don't give forward-looking views on pricing, and so I think that's probably the best plan to, to stick to that here. You know, you're, you're, which is not to say your question is not a fair one. I just think, you know, for us to talk about future pricing is probably not something we should do too much. Other than to say, I think, you know, one of the one of the keys to our success as we look ahead, as it has been recently, is our agility. And uh, we've proven ourselves pretty agile during that last year, including including with recent pricing we've taken into the marketplace relatively quickly. And I attribute that to the fact that we have an always-on capability. And so, um, in a, in, a, in a volatile market, trying to be certain is uh, is not a good place to be. Um, you, what you need to be is thoughtful, and you need to be fast. And I think we're both of those things, and we're going to try to continue to be both of those things. So you raise a good question. We're not going to answer directly because we usually don't talk about pricing, but I do believe that the key challenge in the volatile environment is to be clear and to be to be agile, and we will certainly endeavor to do that, and we feel good about our ability to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. Our next question comes from David Palmer with Evercore ISI. Please proceed. Uh, thanks. Um, you know, Andrew mentioned that mega broker survey and in, 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 in that survey and in the Q&A, they cited um, there's consumer and category insights that the food companies have as a reason why the food companies were more bullish about demand 
than the retailer customers were. In other words, you had, you got had better level of understanding about where things have been more sticky and for good reason. What, what is your latest thinking about categories and brands that you think most benefited in a semi-permanent way uh, from COVID and, and perhaps because of consumers embracing new habits? And I have a quick follow-up. Hey, David, it's John Newdy. Uh, as we look at our business, we think our meals and baking businesses particularly benefited during the pandemic, and it's all that in the sales numbers. As we really dig into our consumer insights, uh, consumers um, change their, their habits. You know, obviously baked a lot more. We believe that some of that will be sticky. It's more than just food. It's really bringing joy to the family and, and bringing the family together, which is terrific. And then Jeff mentioned uh, Melania was learning to cook, and, and that's something that's going to stick as well. So all of our research would say certainly we're not going to go, uh, you know, stay at the elevated levels that we've seen during the pandemic. Um, but consumers will eat at home more than they did prior to the pandemic, and they'll use these new skills to, uh, to uh, you know, use our products more than prior to the pandemic as well. So we're spending a lot of time. We've got a lot of new insights, really digital insights, really leveraging first-party data that we have with uh, Box Talks for Education, Pillsbury.com, BettyCracker.com. That's really giving us some rich uh, views into a consumer's day and their journey. And we think, uh, again, via that data, there's going to be some things that stick for the future. You know, one uh, – thanks for that answer. But one one category that I am really confused by is cereal. Uh, it's an at-home category, but it's perhaps part that lives in that world of convenience, that compressed morning-day part. In other words, cereal has really lost a lot of share of at-home breakfast during COVID. If that's a way to think about it, you know, at-home breakfast getting the benefit of people being at home, but perhaps cereal not being as much of a part of that. Cut, you know, in other words, cereals up 1% over the last two years. Not really that impressive. How are you thinking about cereal going forward? Do you think it actually has a bit of a rebound as people get back to convenience, or is this sort of just the, the new normal that, or the existing normal, one of the one of the few categories that really d- didn't get affected by COVID at all and it's just sort of low growth? Any thoughts there? Yeah, absolutely, David. So, so for sure, I think as consumers were home, uh, they had more time to prepare breakfast, and you saw things like eggs and, and pancakes grow more quickly than cereal. Uh, we do believe cereal will continue to grow into the future, and uh, again, as we look uh, over that two-year period, uh, the category did grow. We grew even more aggressively than that. So again, we grew 60 basis uh, points of share in fiscal 21. That's 31 consecutive months of share growth, 10 consecutive quarters, 4 consecutive years. And we believe that cereal is important uh, today. It'll be important in the future. Uh, it's used, obviously, for breakfast. It's used for snacking throughout the day. Uh, we've got some great innovation coming this past uh, this coming year. Uh, and at the same time, we know that our marketing continues to work. Things like Cheerios and our cholesterol messaging, uh, our kid fun messaging around cinnamon toast crunch and lucky charms. Uh, we believe the category will continue to grow. Um, we hope, uh, you know, it's probably not going to be uh, high single digits, but we think a little bit of growth in that category uh, is in our future. And I think as things get back to normal, to your point, but more normal, and consumers are, are back to school and back to the office, we'll see some of the convenience uh, that Zero provides, uh, providing a bit of a tail under the category. That's helpful. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question comes from uh, Faiza Alwi with Deutsche Bank. Please proceed. Yes, hi, thank you. Good morning. Um, I wanted to first just ask about, you know, your investments. Um, so I know you've, t- you've increased media spending and you've also spent to build critical capabilities. And I'm curious how you're thinking about investments as we look at fiscal 22. Um, you know, essentially I'm asking, like, are, are you expecting media spending to continue to increase at that, you know, double-digit figure that we've seen over the last two years? Um, and then where – or should we stay at, at, at the level that we're at? Um, and then how much more investment in capabilities do you need, um, you know, from here on out? So, so let, me, let me take that one a little bit, and then, Kobe, if there's any background you want to give as well. On the, you know, we're not going to give specific guidance on our media spending for next year. You know, I would say when we, when we talked at Cagney before, we had talked about, you know, as we look into the future, we'd have media grow, grow roughly in line with, with sales over time. And, and, you know, we'll see what happens this coming year. But, but that's what we said we would do over time. In terms of investments, I, I, you know, we're really pleased what we've seen out of our data and analytics capabilities. And, 
John Newdy touched on box tops a little while ago. We digitized that. In, in our opening remarks, we talked about some of the things we're doing in PET. You'll hear more, a lot more about that this coming year. We've tied together an omni-channel approach in China with our shops and our retail, which is yielding some good insights, some great results. We like what we're seeing there. And even on the cost side, as we look at our global sourcing efforts, we've tied data and analytics into that to help us with our costing and HMM. And so you can see, you'll see us continue to invest in our data and analytics capabilities because we really like what we have seen so far. And some of that will be foundational and some of that will be um, on the analytics themselves to drive growth, and other parts will be on analytics to help us save to save money. But that'll, I think that'll be a big area of um, of investment, as will our strategy and M&A area, as we again look to further our accelerate strategy. Okay, great, thank you. And then just a second question on Blue Buffalo and the pet segment generally. I know you talked about. Uh, you know, growth in that segment. I'm curious, I mean, it sounds like, you know, category growth is, is going to be strong. Uh, are there any specific plans beyond the, you know, the, the connected commerce initiative that you talked about? Is there any innovation that we should look, look out for? Um, and I know at Cadme you talked about potentially taking Blue Buffalo to international markets. So I wonder if there's any, any plans to do that this year. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, first of all, we're really pleased with our Blue Buffalo performance, including the fourth quarter, where our retail sales grew in the, the mid-double, mid-teens. And so, uh, even if it doesn't look like that on the P&L, you have to remember we're laughing four, four months from last year and the stock up from the year before. And so, the, uh, we're really pleased with Blue Buffalo. We see strong growth ahead. That would be my opening comment. In terms of how we're going to grow, um, this, uh, this digital capability will certainly be a big piece of that, but so will innovation. Um, what we, we really like what we've seen now is the Tasteful launch, and uh, we're literally selling everything we can make from uh, this new Tasteful's cat line. And we under-index in cat, and the margins in that segment are good, and uh, we're highly confident Blue Buffalo can p play a role in that. Uh, we've recently launched some, some innovation in the snacking and uh, the bone launch, and we're excited about what that can be, in addition then to, to clearly bringing online this Tyson acquisition, which we hope to close shortly. And so. We, we're going to grow Blue Buffalo organically, continue to do that. We're bullish about our opportunity to do that, as well as effectively bring on this, this new part of the portfolio, this Tyson Treat business where, where we under-index, and Tyson's done a nice job with that business, but we think you know, combining what we can do with our capabilities and that with the business they already have, we think there's good growth in that as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next question comes from um, Michael Lavery with Piper's Handler. Please proceed. Good morning. Thank you. Morning. Can you give a sense? I, I know you've, you've called out the uncertainty, and, and I think that's all very clear, but can you give a sense um, around out the elasticity, what kind of assumptions you're making for your planning process? Sure. Uh, so as we as – we, uh, built our plans this year. We One of the benefits of our SRM capability is we actually have very detailed uh, demand elasticity models. Um, I would say that and, and also give a nod to the uncertainty of this environment and the fact that inflation in the market is broad spread, it's cross industry, it's global. And so those factors um, all are potentially a setup for, for demand elasticity models that are, are by design backward looking to be, um, you know, for perhaps, uh, you know, overcall the, the elasticity of, of pricing in this environment. So uh, I'd make that note because um, this is an environment where that uncertainty becomes a, a relevant factor as we talk about demand elasticity. And so does that net you out at, at greater elasticities than historical levels, or do you expect it to be pretty consistent with what you've seen before? What's, what's that kind of net out to? Yeah, well, we, our models are built on, on sort of uh, uh, historical expectations. Um, I think what I am also um, giving acknowledgement to is that the environment itself um, is, is reason for us to be cautious about um, being certain that, uh, on, on the call it'll demand elasticity. And there's certainly an environment where um, I think demand elasticity models could be could be wrong um, just because of the breadth of inflation in the market. Okay, that's helpful. And just a follow-up on the, the C-Store and, and food service segment. Uh, you've called out how you expect the, the lift 
to volumes or sales from from more demand or reopening. But can you touch on the impact for for pricing and specifically pass through pricing? Uh, how much of a factor do you expect that to be for the the sales lift, and and should we look be you know modeling an acceleration there, specifically on the the pricing side because of pass through, pass through costs. So uh, you know, so Michael, I would I would say that you know what we see with with our cost cost going up is very broad. I mean, it's it's broad across geographies, it's broad across product segments, it's broad broad across channels, and so um, that would include what we see in CNF. So our cost for our products and our convenience and food service segment are going up as well, and so we would anticipate pricing in our convenience and food service segment uh, because we see our costs going up. And so um, in this environment, not, there's obviously not only inflation in food, but kind of everywhere, and so um, there's no different in CNF, and so we would anticipate uh, pri you know, prices going up. In fact, we've already, uh, we've already increased prices in the food service segment because our costs are going up. And so, uh, but we're, what I will also say is that we're, we're very confident in our convenience and food service business to return to growth this year as, uh, as schools reopen and uh, as people get out a little bit more. Um, we, we are, you know, we're well positioned to, uh, to capture growth that returning to that market. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Thanks. Our next question comes from Chris Groey with Stiefel. Please proceed. Hi, good morning. Hi, Chris. Hi. Just had, hi, just had a couple questions for you. Um, when you gave your, your um, guidance for the year, like your constant currency EPS growth, I am just curious, it does not incorporate the acquisitions or divestures. And I didn't know if you had any kind of quick words on those. We, we've modeled or have um, estimated you know, kind of 1% to 2% dilution for the yogurt business and then slight accretion for the pet treats business. Would that be in the realm of expectations? If you, do you have any thoughts on, on that? So, Chris, this is Kobe. Um, so we, we don't we don't have new information that would would change the perspective we've already given. Obviously, uh, we do expect uh, the the pet treats business to close shortly, um, and uh, obviously it, it, until that point we can't get too much more specific. But it, it is probably important to to give some parameters around what slight accretive means. Um, I think it's important to note. You know, we will we will see a portion of earnings um, contribution for the year. Um, we will also see some some of the uh, purchase accounting uh, related uh, amortization, um, including inventory step up, um, and those those factors will, will lead us to expectations probably in the range of a penny to two pennies uh, accreted for for the year on on, on the pet treats business. Any comments? To, no no changes then on your expectations for yogurt then when that closes, correct? No, 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 and that's that's further out. And uh, okay. you know, we'll, we'll give small color as we get closer. Okay. And I had just one other question, if I could, on the international segments. Um, Asia, Latin America hit about a 5% operating margin for the year. Europe, Australia, about 7.5%. Are these sustainable margins? Could they grow from here? Um, there have some pretty significant moves as we move through the year in terms of improvements in profitability. I just want to get a sense of how much of that was the benefit of, you know, COVID in some cases and, and the pandemic, and how much of it is, um, you know, potential to, to kind of stick, if you will, uh, based on changes you're making in those businesses. Yeah. Chris, uh, the that's a great question. I, I think we've been very pleased with the progress we've made in, in, uh, in margins on both of those businesses in this environment. Obviously, some of that is, is related to the leverage benefits of, of operating in, um, in, in elevated demand. Um, but we've also been um, making a bit and continue to make business model changes in both businesses um, that, that, uh, that are driving margin improvements and uh, actually will continue to make them even uh, contemplated as part of uh, the, the restructuring actions that uh, that we've already announced. So, uh, I would expect um, that we would hold on to uh, to to these to 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 the portion of these margin margin gains and continue to drive margin improvement um, and and get to a much more competitive place on both of these businesses. Okay. Thanks so much for your time. You bet. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question, Frank. Our next question comes from Ken Zaslow with Bank of Montreal. Please proceed. Hey, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Ken. 
I have two questions. One is, you guys have been really early on the data analytics side. What are the specific new capabilities that you are that you need? I, I mean, I'm just a little surprised that you're not there. I guess is kind of what I think. Is you guys were very very early on that. So, what are the new learnings that you are looking to explore and, and do more with? And, and what will be the returns on that? And then I have a second question. So we, we we've been working on our data analyst capability for a couple of years now. Um, you know, I would I would note that you know the first thing we had to do is build a foundation, and I won't get into the details of that in this answer. But we had to build a foundation, and then and then now we're building on top of that with some specific capabilities around around growth capabilities like strategic revenue management, growth capabilities like addressing consumers through things like box tops for education, and you know what we're doing in the pet personalization space as well as what we're doing on the channel in uh, in China. And then on the on and then on the cost side, what we're what we're doing with procurement. But there's a lot more we there are a lot more things that we can do using data and analytics to drive our business. So we'll continue to we'll continue to invest in order to, to drive those parts of the business. So it may seem like a while, but we had to we had to build a foundation first, which is the right way to do it, and now we're building on top of that with, with specific capabilities. Great. My my second question is you put out the the, the three year uh, growth of that you had uh, you know, two percent sales, two percent operating income, and five percent EPS. When you think about the next three years beyond that, does that seem like the right mix, or do you think the changes that you're having should accelerate that by a certain amount of basis points? And how do you think about the next three years? Uh, you know, and again, and not next year, but just thinking about it in a three-year clip. I think that's a good way of thinking about it and how you're positioning it. So I was just curious to see how you think about relative to the last three years. And I'll leave it there. And I appreciate it. <laughs> Again, my, I'm, I'm going to try to make it through this, make it through this year. On, on the, you know, what I would say though, on the, you know, but I, I look, I, I do respect the question. As we look ahead, our, our goal is to get back to sustainable growth and to, to get to two to three percent growth. And and I mean, I'll probably restate something I've said already. That requires us to do two things. One is compete effectively, and I think we've shown over the past couple of years we've really improved our game there to compete. We're competing effectively, you know, pretty much everywhere around the world. So we'll continue to need to do that to get to two to three percent growth, and we'll continue to have to reshape our portfolio. And you, you see that through the divestiture of uh, YoPlay and at least the proposed divestiture of YoPlay in Europe, and you see that with the upcoming acquisition of Pluto. And so we'll look to continue to reshape our portfolio as well as compete effectively to get to that two to three percent growth rate. And so that'll that'll be our plan after this year. And uh, well, we have got a group that's focused on that, and we got another group that's focused on making sure we can deliver what we said we're going to do this coming 12 months. Great. I just think that you, that you know all these things that you're putting in place seems like it, it should you know fuel this growth. But I appreciate the answer, and I look forward to seeing what you guys can do. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. I think that that uh, gets us to the end of our time here this morning. So thank you everyone for your time and attention and uh, appreciate the, the good questions. Uh, please reach out over the course of the day if you have any follow-ups and look forward to uh, talking to you again soon. Bye-bye. That does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line. Have a great day, everyone.